Hello, ladies and gents, it's finally here. Hashtag James the first week. Uh, so, welcome to the first of three videos we're going to be putting out this week. One today, one in a couple of days' time, and then one at the weekend that are going to look at the build up to the assassination of King James the first of Scotland. One that's going to look at the dirty deed itself, uh, the actual night of the assassination, and one that's going to look at the fallout, the aftermath, and the consequences of King James's assassination. Now, I suppose I'm going to have to start with a disclaimer here, just in case anyone is a little bit confused. This video and the, the two that follow it are going to be about King James the First of Scotland, not King James the Sixth of Scotland and First of England. So these aren't going to be videos about the guy who inherits the throne of England from Elizabeth I in 1603. Um, it's not going to be that James. This is King James the First of Scotland, born uh, 1394 and ruled Scotland from 1406 through to 1437. So apologies for anyone who has shown up looking for some um, 17th century action and intrigue. Uh, that is not what this video is going to be about. Uh, we are staying resolutely uh, first half of the 15th century here today. So, James I of Scotland. Uh, James is a king quite unlike any that Scotland has had up to this point. He's kind of an unusual uh, king for the Scots in the early uh, 15th century. Um, and that's because he is something of an expensive King of Scots. Uh, now, I, I mentioned before, James, in theory, ruled Scotland from 1406 through to um, his death, to his assassination in 1437. However, he spends the first 18 years of his reign as a captive in England. The reasons for that are a little bit complicated to get into here. Uh, there will be a video when that anniversary comes round. Um, I, th I think the end of next month or maybe April, um, I'm, not, <laughs> I'm not quite sure, but soon. Um, suffice to say, he, he tries to flee Scotland because of some political intriguing that's going on um, in 1406. He's only 12 at the time. Um, he, he tries to flee Scotland to France. On the way though, he is caught by some English pirates and handed over to the royal administration of Henry IV, the King of England, and he spends then the next 18 years as a prisoner in England. So, what that means is, James doesn't learn how to king here in Scotland, he learns how to be a king down in England. He, uh, he, he, his tutors, as it were, his, his tuition in um, ruling and governing comes not from Scottish examples but from English examples. Now the Scots, uh, particularly in the latter part of uh, the 14th century, grow used to kind of kingship on the cheap. They are used to kings that live within their own means financially for, for, uh, 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 for the most part. Um, who don't demand a great deal in terms of taxes, um, who more or less let the aristocracy just get on with spending their own money however they please, basically. Um, uh, that, ladies and gents, is very different than how things work in England, um, especially under Henry IV and Henry V. Uh, remember Henry IV, uh, he, he comes to power basically by deposing and possibly arranging the death of uh, his predecessor, Richard II. Um, so Henry has everything to prove when he becomes king. Um, this is a, 
a, a, a sort of a new dynasty, um, a dynasty that is keen to emphasize its prestige um, and its importance. This is also, of course, the early 14th century um, when there is a general European upswelling in terms of um, the, uh, the, the desire of kings, the ambition of, of kings and princes to uh, emphasize their importance and their significance through spending, <laughs> through ostentatious display. Um, this goes into building projects, it goes into artworks, it goes into um, the procurement of cannon. Cannon are a very new, uh, very expensive uh, type of military equipment in the early 14th century. Too expensive really for private individuals, for earls and barons and so forth to invest in, um, but good for kings and princes to invest in, using of course money screwed out of their subjects to show off the fact that you know a king or a prince is a very different kind of uh, person. There is a different kind of prestige associated with, with royalty um, that only kings and princes can, um, can uh, engage with and display, uh, differentiating them quite sharply from even the greatest of their subjects. So, uh, during his time in English captivity, James learns the lesson, um, learns uh, to expect his subjects to finance um, his uh, ambitions, um, his desire for, for ostentatious display, um, his uh, desire to prove himself to be a great pan-European pan -European prince uh, like Henry V, which whom he has, it seems, kind of quite a positive relationship given that one of them is um, a captive and the other one is a captor, um, or along the lines of the Dukes of Burgundy or the Kings of France or any of these other um, big European names at the time. Uh, James comes back bearing these ambitions and expecting that the Scottish political community is going to pay for them. James also comes back to Scotland in uh, 1424 with a brand new English wife, uh, Joan Beaufort, who again will show up a lot in a great many videos, I'm sure, um, as, as the channel goes on. Don't really have that much time to get into how um, cool and interesting she is um, here today, although she's definitely going to come up a lot more in the uh, following two videos as well. Now, the marriage between James and Joan, it perhaps unusually for um, a medieval marriage, certainly a, a, a medieval um, aristocratic and noble marriage, um, it does seem to be based to some extent on the mutual affection of, of the two parties. Certainly James seems greatly enamoured of, uh, of Joan. Uh, he writes, uh, while he's in captivity, uh, a poem known as The King's Queer, where he uh, expounds at some length on his, uh, his deep personal feelings towards Joan. Um, but it is uh, still fundamentally a political marriage. Whatever the two, um, the two parties, James and Joan, may feel about one another, um, it fundamentally is still a, um, a political arrangement. It's an attempt by the English to secure James's continued association with the English royal administration as opposed to the French royal administration, which is normally um, the, the sort of main uh, sort of diplomatic uh, what would you call it, the main dif diplomatic avenue I suppose that the Scots would tend to pursue um, associations with France 
rather than with England, the marriage between David and Joan, eh, sorry, James and Joan rather, is supposed to bring James on side, bring Scotland on side, and allow the English to capitalise on some of the recent gains they've enjoyed in the ongoing Hundred Years' War with France. And like any political marriage, uh, Jim, uh, the, the marriage between James and Joan, it carries with it certain responsibilities on James's part. Uh, if he's going to take this new wife back to Scotland, he's going to have to provide for her. He's going to have to provide a dowry. He's going to have to pay for her, um, in effect, because um, again, regardless of the fact that James and Joan do seem to have had this deep um, affection for one another, fundamentally, um, these kind of political arranged marriages in the medieval period are still kind of sexist, kind of property driven, um, not really that cool, even when the people involved might otherwise, you know, uh, be, be on board with the relationship that's being expressed. And so, King James comes back to his kingdom in uh, 1424 with a lot of expectations in terms of his uh, desire for money, his need for money, um, in both cases to pay for these ambitious, ostentatious projects that he wants to uh, pursue to show off what a, a grand European um, princeling he is, um, but also a need to fulfil these uh, quite specific and quite demanding financial arrangements associated with the marriage to Joan. Now he's lucky early on in the sense that when he comes back, the um, aristocratic community has um, suffered some really quite serious setbacks. Obviously in the king's absence, various powerful um, aristocrats, various kind of power blocks, particularly um, the Albany Stuarts, who are the king's, well, they start with his uncle and move down into his cousins, um, but also uh, the Black Douglases, who are a, a very important or uh, represent a very important kind of magnate block in the south of the kingdom. Um, both of these two factions, if you like, have been more or less running things in the king's absence, but both of them um, have suffered some quite uh, serious blows. The patriarchs of these two uh, big power blocks, uh, one of them dies, uh, this is the, the head of the uh, Albany Stuarts, the founding member of the Albany Stuart, Stuart family, um, Robert Stuart, Duke of Albany, uh, he dies four years before um, James comes back and his son Murdoch, or uh, Murdoch if you prefer, um, has, has struggled to hold together this sort of vast affinity that allowed um, uh, Robert Duke of Albany to, to dominate Scottish politics for the sort of last 40 years or so before his death. Um, and Archibald, fourth Earl of Douglas, the head of the uh, Black Douglas, kindred and affinity um, dies in battle uh, at, at the same battle uh, at the Battle of Vinoy this is uh, in, in, in the same year as James comes back to Scotland um, and dies alongside an awful lot of Black Douglas and Albany Stuart adherents. So the political community is kind of soft and vulnerable um, in ways that it hasn't been while the king uh, was absent. When the king comes back it's, it's kind of um, it's, it's vulnerable to James's uh, attempts to have his new um, progressive, um, ambitious and expensive form of kingship thrust upon it. And the more successful James is in getting his way, in um, you know, establishing this uh, new brand of expensive kingship as the norm, the more momentum builds behind it. Um, and James has a great many quite prominent successes in various um, uh, uh, arenas, uh, domestic and international, um, which help maintain and, and generate this image of James as um, something new, some, something uh, dynamic and something that is going to be difficult to challenge. So, for a while, all seems to be going well. 
for King James. Uh, he is, generally speaking, managing to screw money out of his subjects for all sorts of interesting and ambitious projects. He builds, for example, uh, the first palace at Linlithgow on the site of an older um, uh, royal manor. Uh, you can still visit the pal palace at Linlithgow, although it, it, not all of it now is, is uh, James's. Lots of subsequent building work done there by, by subsequent kings. Uh, he invests a great deal in cannon, in artillery, um, builds up this very uh, impressive collection of, of um, artillery, uh, and he sets about trying to promote Joan as a major landowner in Scotland. He uses a lot of the land that he takes from the Albany Stuarts. Uh, when James comes back, one of his first priorities is to break the power of the Albany Stuarts, helped, of course, by these reversals that, that uh, the aristocratic community in general, um, but the Albany Stuarts in particular, have suffered uh, in, in, in and around that, that period when he, he returns. Um, so he basically wipes the Albany Stuarts off the map and he gives a lot of the stuff that he takes from them, a lot of the land, a lot of the castles and so forth, to Joan. He also starts promoting Joan um, as, as I say, as a landowner, particularly in Perthshire. Now Perth is about there-ish on our map. So in this kind of area here, um, James is, 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 is promoting um, Joan's interests. Uh, James himself is particularly, um, has a particular association uh, with Perth, treats it almost as a kind of unofficial capital of Scotland um, in his own, uh, uh, during his reign. Um, so again, is, is tying Joan into um, to the, the royal administration that he's trying to build for himself by, by promoting her interests in that area. Um, and, and again, this is uh, something that W a, a, an area where you can see the kind of genuine personal affection of the king finding expression. He also promotes her as a, a possible regent, uh, a, you know, someone to run the kingdom in the event that he should die and leave an underage heir. Now, bear that in mind, folks, because that's going to become important in the later videos. However, as intimated before, a lot of James's success is predicated on image, on prestige. The more successful he is, the more it seems like the aristocratic community can't really do very much to fight back against the king's aggressive, acquisitive um, attitudes. Um, but by the same token, it may not take much by way of failures, by way of, um, by way of setbacks to undermine that image, to undermine that prestige. And when that prestige goes, the king can start to look very vulnerable indeed. And of course, the king's behavior, the, 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 uh, the king's aggressive, acquisitive um, style of kingship creates enemies, as you might expect. Um, there is a perhaps a general feeling in the aristocratic community at large that actually they're not really a big fan of this whole expensive kingship thing and maybe things would be a little bit better if we went back to the old king, kingship on the cheap. Um, but there are some more specific enemies starting to emerge, particularly towards the end of James IV's reign. Uh, I mentioned before that in Perthshire, James really pushes the interests of his wife, um, partly out of um, a desire to fulfill the requirements of that uh, marriage deal that he makes with the English, but also um, because of his his you know personal feelings for for Joan and uh, you know as a, a demonstration of his. Um, his his care for her for her well-being, but in doing so, he starts to alienate some particularly significant 
uh, figures in the area, particularly his uncle, Walter Stewart, Earl of Athol. Now, Athol is that kind of area, just to the north, well, what's that, northwest, <laughs> sorry folks, uh, the northwest of uh, Perth. So, as Joan's sphere of influence, as her landed interests expand in Perthshire, the Earl of Athol's recedes. And the Earl of Athol, uh, by the 1470s, is getting rather old. Uh, he had a son who has predeceased him. He has a grandson, Robert Stuart, um, who is very close to the king. Remember that name, ladies and gents, because that's going to come up particularly tomorrow um, as well. Um, but the elderly um, and, and possibly kind of um, you know, in, increasingly frail Walter Earl of Athol can only look at the expansion of uh, Joan Beaufort's place in, um, well, in the royal administration, but particularly in central Scotland there, and worry that perhaps uh, the interests of his own family are increasingly under threat and may not survive him. Um, if he dies, leaving his um, grandson, Robert Stewart, who is a, a, a grown man, but obviously significantly younger than his grandfather, um, and indeed younger than the king, um, it may be the case that if, if Robert Stewart is left on his own without the protection of his, his you know, old and experienced grandfather, that the interests of the earldom of Athol may very well just diminish um, and poor Robert might be strong-armed into um, selling the family silver, as it were, and, and allowing Joan to emerge as the dominant figure, um, the dominant landholder in um, central Scotland. Now, as long as the king's prestige and image survives, as long as he still seems to be this unassailable figure, um, that's kind of okay. However, however, in 1436, the wheels come off the wagon somewhat. Uh, you'll remember when I, I introduced Joan, I mentioned that the marriage was supposed, uh, the marriage of, of uh, James and Joan, that is, was supposed to bring James on board as an English ally. Well, that plan doesn't work very well at all. Even by 1428, only four years after the king has been released, he's already talking uh, with the French, making deals and inviting the English to see if they can offer him anything better, otherwise he's going to take Scotland back into what I suppose we would think of as the Owl Alliance. Um, by 1436, all of this back and forth, all of the sort of negotiations and so forth have led to open war between um, England and Scotland. And in 1436, James gets an army together, gets that big impressive um, artillery train that I mentioned that he's been investing in for most of his reign and leads the Scots to uh, lay siege to Roxburgh Castle, which is about there-ish on our map. Um, right down in the south, Roxburgh Castle is, um, well, it was, is built as a Scottish castle in um, the 12th century, but has been in English hands for almost 100 years by the time James lays siege to it in um, 1436. This would be a huge coup for James if he can take this castle back. Um, one of only two really, that and Berwick, that the Scots still lay claim to, that the English still have a hold of. And James might quite understandably feel quite confident when he lays siege to the castle. He has this huge um, artillery train, he has quite a sizable army with him. However, however, um, things, things go very quickly wrong for uh, James. This big uh, army, including many, many important magnates from all over Scotland, 
becomes kind of a hotbed of sedition. Lots of the bitterness and recrimination that is developed um, amongst the aristocratic community directed towards the king starts to bubble to the surface. The king, it seems, starts to become increasingly uncomfortable that perhaps he is not, in fact, safe um, within uh, the army. And it's possible that actually he leaves the army altogether, um, possibly on the insistence of Joan, before the siege is even over. Um, while the siege is still ongoing, while the Scots are still, in theory, trying to get into and take over Roxburgh Castle, um, James, it seems, scarpers disappears off, leaves the army altogether, possibly out of fears for his own safety. That is hardly the act of this, um, you know, prestigious, unassailable figure that the king has tried to present himself as up to this point. And it gets worse because the English respond to the siege of Roxburgh by sending an army north. Um, if the Scots remain at Roxburgh, they might actually have to fight this army in the field. And as long-time readers of the blog will know, as a general rule, fighting the English in open battle is just suicide for the Scots. That is the worst thing a Scottish army can do, almost always. And so the Scots very prudently decide, well, they're going to lift the siege and they're going to go. They're going to get out of there. Um, they are not going to give battle. However, they leave behind James's fancy pants artillery train. They leave behind all of those cannons that James has spent all of that money on over all of those years, and the English take all of those cannons into their own possession. This is a huge embarrassment, a huge humiliation for the Scottish Royal Administration in general, but for James in particular. This cracks in a moment that image of James as the unassailable, unquestionable, authoritative uh, King of Scots. And this, of course, gets his enemies, particularly Walter Stewart, Earl of Athol, thinking that now may in fact be the time to strike. Now might be his opportunity to put an end to James. Because for a while, it seems, Walter, the old serpent, as contemporary chronicler Walter Bauer puts it, has been in contact with various figures, um, with associations with the Albany Stuarts, um, and with other reasons to be, um, to be uh, dissatisfied with James's um, rule. And so, in February 1437, when King James and Queen Joan are staying at Blackfriars just outside of Perth, Walter and the men who he's been making his plans with, drawing his plans up with, they decide that now may in fact be the time to strike. Ladies and gents, if you come back in a couple of days time, we'll have a look at just exactly how they decide to finish off the king. Thank you.